Recovery is stupendous. Achievable. Hope. Freedom. 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 Empowering. It's unique to everyone. It's a journey, not a destination. Getting a new lease on life. It's finding restoration after you fall down. Recovery is having the freedom to enjoy life. For me, it was finding a way to really love myself. My recovery is possible in part because of my own sense of purpose. Welcome to Recovery Talks. This is your hostess, Leah Wetzel. I'm MPN's recovery coach. And I'm here today with a very, very special guest. I've been wanting him to come on here with us and actually interview him. And, you know, he's just been doing such amazing work. And I had the honor of meeting him last year doing it during a MMIP event up in Cut Bank. And I was honored to be interviewed by him. And now I get the chance to, to uh, reverse the roles. And so we're here today with Terrence LaFromboys. And uh, Terrence, do you wanna tell us a little about who you are? Well, good morning. Okay, next up, Wax. Nistu, Nidu, Nidaniku, Ishisakuma, Papuma, K, Nipidam, Inakisuku, Kanaki, Sakuma, P, Isegatoi. Good morning, friends and relatives. Uh, my name is Entering Thunders Lodge. That's my Blackfeet name given to me by the late Georgia Molly Kicking Woman. And I come from the Blackfeet Reservation. Um, Currently, right now, I just graduated from the University of Toronto out of the School of Factor, uh, Factor Intuitus School of Social Work. And I just recently got my master's in Indigenous Trauma and Resiliency. So I'm very just grateful uh, to be in this space right now here, because uh, previously I was with Tribal Health, with uh, MSPI, Methamphetamine Suicide Prevention Initiative, for the past two years and was very grateful for that opportunity. Um, that grant actually ended uh, and they were waiting on some service funding and it actually just came through. So hopefully the tribe continues to pick that grant up. I come from a, a long line of really good people on both sides of my family. Um, my mother is Eva Racine. My father is Mike Laframboys. Uh, my grandparents are Aloysius uh, and Leona Racine, and Mary Ellen and Conrad LaFromboise, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, dating back to some prominent people in my lineage, Adam Whiteman and uh, John Ground. So very grateful to, to just be um, in a space to, um, to find myself at these crossroads of serving the community and you know, just trying to figure out my path in life. So that's a little about me right now. And uh, just very grateful to be here. Currently, I'm a mental health consultant. And I also uh, am a cultural preservationist, which is a new catchy word where we're just trying to create more space for culture, for education, mentoring. Um, but there's a lot of cultural preservations preservationists that we have within the community so just very grateful to be one of them that's amazing Terrence and I'm so happy for your rise because since the first time I ever met you um, there's just something so so very special about you and um, it's not just me that sees that it's it's everybody that you come in contact with you're just one of those people that I don't know, you just light up a room and, and you really, there's, you're one of a kind. There's, there's nobody like you. And that's what's so very special about you and your heart. You know, you have such a pure heart. And so let's go into our first question here. What really led you down this specific path, Terrence, that you're on? So I think a lot of my journey has been with my experience growing up and in a very dynamic uh, upbringing, having culture and having 
a specific, I guess you'd call res life or that cowboy culture that we're all kind of accustomed to growing up on the reservation and having those both specific paradigms in my life and really creating a sense of balance, but also chaos. I've, I've been very unfortunate to been a big part of the, the sy- systemic things that occur on reservations, some of the symptoms, uh, and a lot of them stemming from my childhood and having a lot of physical and mental, emotional, and sexual abuse in my life. Uh, and that journey has been very hard. Uh, especially to come to terms to and to heal from those experiences. Uh, It's been a hard journey to talk about sexual abuse and especially it being so recent for me and, and knowing that that has been a part of my journey because of how I would portray myself in the community, especially being kind of like a class clown my whole life and, and using humor to um, hide some of the pain, but also going and leading into some of the the issues that we see in our community, like underage drinking and and underage uh, drug use and and experiencing that at a very early age with friends and family and and it being so normal. I thought that's what it was, what it was meant to be. I thought that's how life was, especially growing up on the reservation. So it was very normal to me to be so chaotic and resi and, and knowing that at the other part of that, I had a very, I had a very wholesome, loving experience in, in my life where, where I had a lot of love. And, and with that, a lot of my love came a lot of the people that hurt me emotionally and sexually. So very kind of uh, split, <clears throat> especially how I grew up. And carrying that with me and, you know, really being able to tell that story recently and hopefully that others could, could, could know that, you know, there, there are people out there that in your healing journey, a big part of that is, is being able to tell your truths to, to know that's that, that, that's not a part of you was done to you. And that's kind of like what led me down specific areas in my life, whether it was good or bad. And in my life, I was really kind of looking to get away from the reservation. So in that process, I graduated in 2007 and I was going to the University of Billings and I wasn't doing too well. Uh, uh, Educational wise, I was kind of lacking and being accountable and disciplined in school. Uh, I didn't, I didn't see a lot of like similar faces to mine. It was a huge culture shock, even living in Billings, coming from the reservation, even knowing there was a reservation just so far down the road, but I didn't do too well. And at that same time, one of my support systems passed away. Uh, My grandfather who raised me uh, died from cancer and he died from a long battle of cancer. So he lasted a very long time, but it was a huge part of me and it really created, I guess, more of that split of what was real and how to really cope with healing and what I thought healing was. So I knew that I, 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 I reverted back to old ways. I started drinking and using again. And, and, and I moved from there to, to SKC where I was going to school and doing very well. And in that process, I also was not, you know, was really faking it to make it was really showing people lies and, and deceit while at the same time uh, hurting and abusing myself and others in that process. And that's, I, I, I have to carry that with me. But in that time, I also met my son's mother where in 2011, my son was going to be born and I was battling a lot of depression, a lot of uh, mental health issues, especially coming from grief, coming from not really looking inwardly through this process through my whole life, knowing that I was carrying a lot of heavy burdens deep within myself and how that eventually led me to Kicking Horse Job Corps, where I uh, got my CDL and um, took heavy equipment operators. Then from there, I moved home in 2013 and worked at uh, the, the trash, the sanitation department for the tribe for about a year while also coaching for middle school. 
And it was in that moment, and this is where I get to that moment. Sorry, I had to go roundabout story to get there, but it was in that moment I was realizing that all of my experiences and, and coaching were coming to a head where I was looking at youth that I was that were almost mere images of myself or my younger self, kids that were acting out oddly or, or having the same similar behaviors that I used to to do where sometimes we get by because the school systems don't look at those specific students, especially if you're in sports, you're, you're kind of the middle of the room. You know, the kids in the front get looked at, the kids in the back are, are usually the ones that are in trouble. The ones in the middle um, were the ones that were left behind, especially with the No Child Left Behind Act, but it's a whole nother story. And it was a, a defining moment where Dr. Billy Joe Kipp, my grandmother's niece, um, so I call her my auntie, and said, you need to get into school. There's this two plus two program. Other people were saying, get into school. So I got into the EMT program and uh, I got my EMR certificate from one of the paramedics who works in Cup Bank now. So very blessed to have that underneath me with a CDL, but it was that two plus two program and, and the, the teachers and the environment while well, going to University of Montana and BCC at the same time, learning tools on looking at ways to um, help people um, was a, a gift. And I took it from there and graduated with my bachelor's in 2019, just two years after receiving my AA from my two AAs from BCC. And it was after graduation, I was working with uh, Gona which was out of Coffin and Associates and Tribal Tech. And in that process, it was another crossroads where a relative of mine who's in the mental health, John Bird, told me, hey, nephew, here's this poster. And it was a Bridging the River poster for the University of Toronto. And they were looking for international students to get into this Indigenous Trauma and Resiliency graduate program. And my heart exploded. Um, there was something that during that time, uh, in the past six years, there's been a lot of grief and to, to go, th to, to get to a certain point to know things were happening purposefully was just meaning the most to me, just gratitude. And I was at manpower working as one of the public relations communicators and very blessed to have that experience working for Blackfeet manpower and George Kipp and his amazing crew and going from there and graduating and getting into a master's program and then transitioning into uh, overseeing my own program at MSPI. And I think that's what led me. And in the past two years have been the hardest, not only dealing with suicide, but COVID death and a pandemic and, and then more suicide. It's, it's just been a, it's been a heavy journey. And sometimes I, I wonder how I even carry myself, but I know for me, I, I create a space for myself by being mindful, praying, smudging, and allowing myself to cry, allowing myself to feel those emotions that I would most likely in the past try to push away with drugs or alcohol. Um, but to lean into that pain and to allow it to, 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 to go and to be in you and how you hold it and get rid of it is, is, is the best part. And you usually have to communicate that with a support team. You usually have to have a wellness plan in place, but you have to just feel those emotions first. And I think as men, that's harder in our society. And it's, it's something I'm hoping that with this podcast and with just continuing to talk about my experiences, um, the other men would feel inclined to share their story, to be able to let go of some of that hurt and pain in a good way, that they could start up, that they could start themselves on a healthy journey. And that's what those past two years have been about, is learning the tools to heal myself, to help others. Um, because you can't help others if you're not uh, helping yourself. And you can be a wounded healer as well. You could still be hurt, healing yourself while helping others. Don't ever feel less than because you're going through experiences 
and you, you feel like you can help others, but you never step out of your boundaries. That's, that's something I think that's insecurities, which is a big part of trauma, shame. So remember that trauma was something that was done to you. You don't have to hold on to those experiences. And that's what I've learned. And I'm hoping I could be able to give um, because I think I wanted to save this uh, and I didn't want to put it a part of my introduction was I just recently was hired on as the zero suicides grant specialist uh, for the addictive and mental Dis health disorders division within the Department of Public Health and Human Services for the state of Montana. So primarily I'll be overseeing specific tribal communities that have the zero suicide grant. Um, so I'm very blessed to have started at a specific point in my experience and, and knowing that there was a lot of obstacles and, and to be here and to be able to continue to give knowledge and hopefully hold space for not only my community, but for many other indigenous communities within the state of Montana that could benefit from some of the teachings that the master's program has given me. And, and that, that is for everyone to, to learn. So just very excited. Oh man, I, I get excited just listening to you. I know how knowledgeable you are, I guess I should say. And anybody that's within the midst of of this gentleman knows the power behind um, what his capabilities are. And so I couldn't, I couldn't think of anybody better for that position. And I, I'm just honored to be able to be in the midst of watching your magic, you know, play out. And hopefully someday, you know, our paths will cross like they did before. No doubt. You speak of John Bird. Um, one of the most, you know, shout out to John Bird. Uh, that's, that's my relative too. And one of the most also knowledgeable of Skani Pekani men I know. He did one of the Blackfeet traditional uh, trainings last year. He did a, a wellness medicine wheel uh, training with Car Carla and Man, I, I implement that training into my everyday life still. And so he's definitely, I couldn't imagine the work that the two of you could do. Well, uh, saying something like that, Leah, is, is, is very fortuitous because I think we've had a little insight where I commented in one of your posts where John uh, gave me this idea or he told me that there's this upcoming thing that is being created by two women, Barbara Aragon and Deborah Rattler, created this uh, Circles of Safety curriculum. And he had mentioned that they're going to be implementing that within the United States soon, within Indigenous communities. And it's something that well, I, I told him what's crazy because, and shout out to Barbara Aragon and, and one of my teachers and Deborah Rattler, who I got to work with, and John Bird, and shout out to Jane Milton Mose and the Middleton Mones Institute, where Jane's master's program is is reconstructing the circle bringing the family back to the circle is one of the main highlights so in terms of working with families and addiction is you got to work with the whole family not just the individual something I think you talk about all the time and that's something that has been very that you've been very passionate about so I think that's where our paths will most likely cross and I kicked to him I said you should train me and Leah in this curriculum because that's something I think when you're creating a space, you have to have a good team. I've worked with Jane twice now in communities where we're, where we're working with uh, residential school survivors. And that, you know, excuse my words, that shit's heavy, man. You know, when you're working with people that are carrying so much trauma that, you know, Western society wants to say, well, that's historical. You know, for a lot of Indigenous people, that's only 40, 50, 60 years ago. And two generations away, three generations away, it, it sticks with you. And that's where we have generational trauma. That's where knowingly you have to be trauma-informed to really be working with Indigenous communities. And if you're not, you're not creating safe spaces for them. And I think that's something we, we're, we're probably going to talk about soon, but... Hopefully our paths cross with that. 
circles of safety curriculum and and shout out to all those magnificent mentors for us uh, for myself definitely i tell you what like the blessings that you've had within your journey of education and it definitely it's hard work and dedication right like you speak of growing up um, as an indigenous man on the res dealing with historical and intergenerational trauma and and fighting through mental health and anxiety issues and and still making it to the top and one of my favorite people and you know respected elder of our our tribe always tells me this life wasn't meant to be easy and it can sometimes be harder on those ones that are most deserving and so I definitely yeah. think that's you and um you know again it's just a huge huge honor to sit here with you and you know share this safe space and and listen to you you gotta write a book man you have like <laughs> I couldn't imagine no there's there's like I, and then I think that's where you know there's so many people within the reservation that have if not similar stories and I think for me I'm still in that journey I, I still need to there's still a lot that I'm still doing and still healing um and I, I I still suffer from like imposter syndrome and as I was going through my master's program I was speaking with some of my teachers who were going through some of the same things as I was and it blew my mind and, I, and I, that's when I realized in that moment in that moment that you know we're all human beings going through these human experiences and what separates indigenous people is we have that connection to these metaphysical things and when you bring that metaphysical space into your physical space, it's like you're creating an atmosphere for yourself that is more that is more positive than negative. And I think that's where, you know, if we channeled a lot of the things that we you know we do now into more positive, holistic things, you would see change. Or if we started with the family, you know, we would see a lot of change. What has been your favorite accomplishment or your or your real you know that point within the work you do within your community what has been um the best part of all of that i don't know i mean there's been so many things that i'm just grateful for to have experienced um and, and, and honestly it's just been working with the youth to be able to serve in that capacity of just being a, a mentor um and, you, you know, it's going to get me emotional, but I'll talk about two experiences. Uh, one of them was just, you know, for me, it's been a big thing for me to be a good dad. Um, in my life, I just want, wanted to create a space for my son to exceed and not to experience some of the things that I experienced uh, at his age and younger. And I could see where uh, the learned behaviors and the trauma that I've experienced, you know, I've given that to him. And there's some things that I could, I've taken back and there's some things I'll never, ever get back. And that's as a parent, we have to learn from those experiences. So that way we never create more shameful avenues or, or hurtful experiences for our children to carry that. Because that's something I think generations before us never took into account because we never really looked at the way we mentally and emotionally kind of disregarded a lot of those growing up with even we could see it within generations now and that's one of the things working within indigenous communities is a hard thing is the stigmas of mental health because we don't understand that you know just simple teasing creates a lot of um, disconnections to the spirit and we've never had those deviances before within our traditional culture those something that's western society has created and there's a study about it and sits a gate to, to be but that's have always been a, that has always been a big part of me is being a father, and I got recognized by the school board within the indigenous program because my son's in the immersion program, and he is now ten years old, and um, he's in fourth grade. He's in Miss Armstrong. Shout out to Miss Armstrong, and Pat Armstrong, and I got recognized when he was in second grade for just being there at all of these functions. So it was something for me that was a huge accomplishment. 
knowing that, you know, I was doing the right things and I was, I was on a path where I was healing myself while also creating better pathways for my son. So I, I, I've learned to not be so hard on myself, to know that it's okay to breathe and that as a father and a parent, we have all these expectations of us from the society, from the culture, even from the curriculum itself. And that's where some of the things that we need to start changing as parents, you know, and, uh, and looking at how our children are being educated in today's society. I mean, not to deter, but look what's happening on a macro level in the United States, you know, the school shootings. One of the things said, I think it said it mentioned where there have been 48 school shootings and 32 since August 1st. So, and, and society wants to say we have a gun issue. I think we have a mental health issue and we have a society that's unwilling to look at mental health in America and in the school system and how the school system creates some of the mental health issues. But we're not looking at those yet. Uh, we're only looking at surface level things such as guns. But something I think the bigger issue we can look at, especially is how do we create safe spaces for our youth? You know, being very, very fortunate to go through a pandemic, we learned one important thing is chaos creates resiliency. So I see a lot of resilient people, but if we're not healing in the right resilient way, we're only creating more bad pathways that we're going to con continue to go down culturally. So I kind of went off on a tangent there. So I, I do apologize because I think you know, I was speaking of accomplishments and I went right into some of the issues. So it's really hard uh, because for me, I don't know. I mean, there's so much to, to finish. There's so much to, to get done. I, I haven't really accomplished anything yet. Some of the, 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 the small accomplishments have been just personal ones. You know, being, being a young Native American man, getting a master's degree in such a hard field as social work where it's predominantly women. It, it, that in itself is hard having that culture uh, or that stigma of you of being more weaker or less than because you are a social worker that's hard in itself because I'm still a man and to fight through some of those stigmas or some of my own insecurities and to let some of those go so to really say I've accomplished a lot I haven't really one thing I think I was leading into was in this process, you know, um, being a mentor, one thing I think we're always looking for is, are we making a difference? And are we touching, are, are, we, are, we, are we touching these kids? Are we, are we creating a space for them to, to grow? Are they, are they taking in what we're saying? And I was going through a really hard time through my master's program uh, at the beginning of 2020. And uh, we just started the pandemic. And we were having this little uh, cultural conference at the high school here at Browning and I was just overwhelmed with grief I was depressed I had two people in my family commit suicide very close people in our community uh just the the, the October November before uh Valdin Kalika committed suicide and he was a huge support system for many people in our community and still weighs heavy within our community um I was dealing with all that and while at the same time working in a suicide prevention program. So I was having a lot of doubts, was having a lot of my own insecurities and my own thoughts of suicide. And in those thoughts, I was just overwhelmed with like, how could I be here and be doing these things and helping people while at the same time <sighs> struggling, struggling in, in many facets of being a good father, a good husband, a good community member, a good worker. And I could really go into detail on not having support within our, our, you know, with our employers where sometimes employers don't have safety plans or our, our self-care modules for their employees. But it was in that moment where I got a letter right when I walked in, they're like, this was for you. And it was from Joanne Grandstaff, who was a teacher at the school. And she said, one of her assignments I read, one of her assignments was for her students to talk about uh, somebody that in their life that they've 
looked up to or, or they feel like has created for them you know a space for a change or and not not some not some more in those words but was just something that it was like who do you look up to and she I read it I, I read the student's um letter and man I broke down and I started getting help and I started reaching out so I always think of that letter I always think about we never know the impact we make in, in people's lives so that person now knows and I made sure he knows the impact he made in my life because in that moment there was just so much want you know want for a better community want for a better lifestyle want for more expensive things you know to be a consumer whatever but there was just this huge cloud of heaviness and just forgive me just to go through that and to be on this other side I'm very grateful I don't take a lot of things for granted. And I think the perception we have when people go through this is where we come from is you're pissy, you're, you're, um, you're too good, or who do you think you are? And I've, I've, I've in the past been very angry at that, but I've come to learn we're only being honest mirrors to people. And in that process of learning that, I've realized a lot of people aren't angry at me they're angry at themselves and you know to to go through that and to just be a space for people and to have that experience I'll never forget that because I'm here today <clears throat> and I'm just very grateful so to be on this podcast to be doing the things I do I'm very grateful and fortunate I don't say this a lot and I this is something I keep to myself so it, it's going to be new to me to share this to a wider public but, you know, not to share my story would be, you know, a disadvantage for somebody that might need it or want it. And sometimes I think, and who am I for somebody to even um, have my story? But I know that's, that's me not being nice to myself because I know that I have, I have this space that I want to give people. And there's people like you and others that, that help me and guide me. So just like, I give for others, you give for me. And that's the only way I'm able to do things like this is that a lot of people ask me, how do you do this? How do you, how do you? I'm like, my support systems, the people that I just surround myself with create that space for me to just be a better person that holds myself accountable. And that's not always 100%. So yeah, I wanted to say that. And I appreciate you giving me that space to do that. I appreciate you, Terrence. Man, you talked, you spoke on so many different subjects that, that, that bother me or excite me, like the whole deal with the school districts. And, you know, I'm here in this urban area and I have a daughter that has that mental health condition. And that's one of our biggest struggles within our home is, is uh, the ignorance of some not all the school system now my stepdad he was a teacher and a coach here for for almost 50 years he was very trauma informed you know there's a lot of money put into these schools for the for them to go through this but but anyway I just really appreciate your outlook and I appreciate your words I appreciate your vulnerability and your honesty and these this this needs to be heard you know, just like when you were interviewing me, you know, I didn't know what was going to come out, but what came out needed to be because that's now our medicine, you know, that's our medicine to help others and, and share with others. And I know for our listeners, there's been a lot brought up and, and I know through hearing this podcast, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, people connecting within what you have to share and, and also, you know, people's aspects be able to, to actually see things that they may not have really realized or paid attention to before. And so I appreciate all that you have shared. And I just have one, one final question for you. So what, what's the future look like for, for Terrence? And I also want to say, man, um, 
you're one of those superhuman people, man. And I'm just like in awe. I could just sit here and listen to you all day. I appreciate that. I, I tend to just like, just talk and talk. Cause I, I feel like sometimes with indigenous people, there's, I, I've always felt with storytelling, especially with indigenous people, there's a story that has to be told within the context of giving a value or, or a song or a teaching. And one of the best ones that I've got to witness in my lifetime, Earl Olperson, you know, the late Earl Olperson. So just very grateful to, and with so, so many of the community that's still in mourning of his loss, to have had those teachings and to, to take those teachings and to be able to make sure that story and uh, where those come from is very important. So I thank you for that space. What's, what's on the horizon for me? What's out there? Well, I'm very excited to start this journey at the state level. Um, I think I've been preparing myself. Uh, I, I, I can tell you personally that I wish I could have stayed within my tribal community. I, I wish I could have been a part of the process of creating some of the systemic policies that need to be created in order of creating more trauma-informed areas for our employees. Some models that really need to be looked at are self-care for employees, are models that are gonna support employees that also are gonna support the clients and the patients that we serve. Because one of the biggest things that I see in here, especially being in the community and being indebted to it, is, you know, there, we, there's, there's all, and we see it on Facebook, we see it in the places we talk, is there's dysfunction and chaos and disconnection. Well, a lot of that is created based off of miscommunication or the lack of leadership. But we really have to be... Uh, aware that we ourselves as community members are a big part of that process that we put so much I guess this idea of what leadership is and we should really look at healing ourselves as individuals and as families and as a community where then you'll see real leaders start to come out on their own because the spaces we create create leaders just if, if the environment can do that just think what the environment is doing now. It's creating domestic violence. It's creating suicide. It's creating drug and alcohol. So if the environment is doing that, then we have to really look at why is the environment and, and how are we supporting the environment, supporting those systemic symptoms of trauma. And I think that's where I really wanted to be at. Um, and I'm hoping that through the state level, that I get more experience in, in, in grant management, that I get more experience of looking at uh, different types of funding and our man managerial, secretarial, all these types of experiences I'm hoping to get. Uh, because with anything that we do, we, we have to do it intentionally or you're doing it all for naught. So we have to have purpose and we have to create intention because that's the only way we're gonna see change. And I, I, I want to say that if there's one thing that I wish I, I, I could say, it's that. So that way our youth can know, that way our community can know, and that way people that are in the healing process or that, that people that are doing the healing need to know that there has to be intention and purpose with everything that we do. And we have to be able to give back without the intention of receiving. True reciprocity is one thing. And there are many people like myself that I'm hoping to create relationships with. That way there's this team of indigenous superheroes, if you will, that are out there creating change. Um, because I am just one person and I'm hoping that I could create space for future leaders. So that way I can be involved with their endeavors or they can be involved with mine. And, and that's, that's what creating culture is all about. That's what's connecting us back is that indigenous side of family and, and what it means to stick together and, and, and to openly communicate the traumas and the pain while at the same time healing and healing others, um, which will create a safe society. But we have to be prepared to let go of some of those things that we've stuck to for so many years. 
So I'm hoping that in the future and with uh, the current positions that I am involved in, I'll continue to do good work because I'll be a part of the Jane Milton Mose Institute as a mental health consultant. I'm hoping to do more mental health consulting within the state of Montana. I'm hoping just to connect and collaborate and to work with indigenous communities within the state and, and to use not only my expertise, but my experience. Because that, that education was, was, was one process. We all have experience that leads us to give us wisdom. But some of us just are uh, our autopsy. We're just crazy. We just continue to do the same things over. It's because we're unwilling to take what, what, that lesson and to learn from it, to give us that wisdom. So we all have that wisdom and we don't need an education to help others. We could have our own paths and our own ways and um, help and hold space and healing others. So thank you so much, Leah for this experience, to be able to tell my story in that way. I hope I did it justice. And, and hopefully I didn't rub anybody wrong in the wrong way. But uh, I know there is more I could talk about, especially one thing that's been irking me is the school thing. Everywhere I go, it's gun control, gun control. But we're not talking about the mental health and how the colonial constructs of education and how the system possibly is creating these mental health disparities, not only within, and it's, it's not a, it's not a person of color thing. It's a human thing. These, these kids are feeling these human experiences and the only way they know how is to hurt themselves or hurt others. Mm -hmm. And we're not creating safe spaces for them. Um, and I could say the same thing for my community. We need to start creating more safer spaces, creating trauma-informed policies that are going to support students and not only discipline but accountability something that's not talked about in terms of well if we're just giving them everything they're going to be spoiled well you're looking at it in a different way we need to start looking at how we can create a space where yeah you might look like it, your child is spoiled but you're also going to hold accountability and discipline within teachings and that's how you do it um and I think there are people that do it great and there are people that have done it throughout time, but because of it's, it's, it's a bigger issue, it's systemic, um, that's when we'll see some of the things change, so. Wow, Terrence. Um, again, some more powerful words and words of wisdom. And no matter where you come from and, and what your background is, uh, there's a lot of power and, and wisdom within what he just shared, you know, and, and we are the change within ourselves, within our families, within our communities. And man, I just can't thank you enough for, for being here with me this morning and for sharing what you have today. And this is just the beginning, my friend. I do know that when we share our stories, it helps others. It's just hard for me because I'm still, I'm still resi and I still live here and, and it's hard to be looked at in a way, but I'm just grateful, just super grateful for the support systems that I have, for the relationships that I'm creating with such amazing, amazing people and to have uh, my family in my corner and yeah, just super thankful and there's a lot of gratitude. So I give that to each and every one of you listeners. So continue to do good things and much respect to Leah and her people at Recovery Talks for allowing this to happen. So yes, of course, there'll be more. Yes, and, and shout out to your beautiful family as well. Thank you folks for joining us for another Recovery Talk. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works, recovery is possible. Recovery is possible. <laughs> recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery is possible.